the explosive, the parachute, the clothes, the plastic, and above all, the fertilizer. All are materials made from ammonia. For plants to grow well, to be healthy and give a high yield, require certain mineral nutrients. We can use duckweed to show how important the nutrients are to plant growth. In this experiment, a similar number of plants was put into distilled water, tap water, and pond water, all at the same time. The plants growing in pond water are green and healthy. They have divided and grown and have long roots. Evaporate some pond water, and you can see that it contains many different substances. These include the necessary nutrients. Tap water contains mainly magnesium and calcium salts. Some vital nutrients are missing. The plants in the tap water have shorter roots and haven't produced as many new plants. The distilled water lacks all the nutrient materials, so the plants in it have nearly all died. If we deprive a plant of a particular nutrient, say calcium, the leaves get discolored and the stem tip dies. When a plant is deprived of potassium, its leaves become twisted and rolled. Compare one set of barley seedlings growing in water which contains all essential nutrients with another set deprived of nitrogen. After only three weeks, differences in height, numbers of leaves, root systems and stem thickness are already evident. The amount of nutrients available over a whole season can make a big difference to growth and yield at harvest. The main elements that crops require are nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. Most of our arable land and some grassland have accumulated residues of potassium and phosphorus and only need topping up from time to time. But nitrogen must always be supplied where crops need it, as reserves of nitrogen are quickly washed out of the soil. Rothamsted Experimental Station is the oldest and one of the largest agricultural research stations in the world. Here, studies are made every year and records kept of how different rates of nitrogen and other elements affect the growth and yield of different crops. Compare this plot of wheat, which has been given no nutrients of any sort, with this plot given four nutrient elements but no nitrogen. And with this plot, given the same four elements, plus a generous application of nitrogen. How do plants get the nitrogen they require? You'll find with a few plants like clover, there are nodules in the roots. These nodules contain a type of bacterium which can absorb nitrogen direct from the air and convert it into compounds on which the plant can feed, a process known as nitrogen fixation. Plants that can do this, such as peas, beans and clover, are known as legumes. But most plants, grass, wheat, barley and other crops, can't convert their own nitrogen as they don't have these nodules. They depend on bacteria in the soil to convert it for them. One source of nitrogen is farmyard manure, but the amount available from this source is insufficient if large areas of farmland are to be farmed efficiently. So man has to supplement the supply of nitrogen with fertilizers. These put nitrogen into the soil in a form which soil bacteria assuming these are present in quantity, can readily convert into plant food. The most acceptable form is ammonia and compounds derived from it. So the first step in making nitrogenous fertilizers is to convert nitrogen into ammonia. To make ammonia, we need nitrogen and hydrogen. The nitrogen comes from the air, which is about four-fifths nitrogen gas. Some of the hydrogen comes from water, and in Great Britain, the rest from natural gas, or methane, piped from beneath the North Sea. From these raw materials, we first have to isolate the nitrogen and hydrogen in the correct ratio of one part nitrogen to three of hydrogen. When this has been done, we can synthesize ammonia. The methane gas is piped into the plant, and the first stage is to remove impurities such as sulfur.
The gas is mixed with steam, heated to about 500 degrees centigrade and fed to the primary reformer. Ammonia synthesis is a complex process and we are going to give only the essential outline. The methane and steam are passed through a nickel catalyst in narrow tubes. The tubes have thick walls to withstand the high temperatures and pressures used in the reaction. The main products are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Some carbon dioxide is also formed and a small quantity of methane is left unconverted. This mixture of gases passes on to the secondary reformer where the gases are joined by air pumped in by a compressor. Some of the hydrogen burns in the air with three important results. Firstly, the oxygen is removed from the air leaving the nitrogen required for ammonia production. Secondly, more steam is formed. Thirdly, the temperature of the gases is raised to over a thousand degrees centigrade, which allows much of the unconverted methane to be removed. Therefore, the gases passing out of the secondary reformer are nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, steam, and traces of methane. The gases we don't want are removed in a series of processes until we are left with nitrogen and hydrogen in the correct ratio of one to three for making ammonia. The reaction of nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia is reversible and we have to find conditions so that the yield of ammonia is as large as possible. The yield depends on the temperature and pressure at which the reaction is carried out. For example, if we take a low temperature of 300 degrees centigrade and a pressure of 50 atmospheres, it would be theoretically possible to obtain 41% ammonia. However, as we increase the temperature, the yield decreases. Now let's take a fixed temperature and see what happens when the pressure is changed. The yield increases as the pressure increases. The highest yield of ammonia is obtained by choosing a low temperature and a high pressure. But unfortunately at 300 degrees, although the yield is high, the ammonia forms much too slowly. So there has to be a compromise on the temperature. It must be low enough to give a satisfactory yield but high enough so that with the aid of a catalyst the ammonia is made quickly. The temperature chosen is often about 500 degrees. What about pressure? The use of very high pressures is impracticable and so the pressure chosen is usually in the range of 150 to 300 atmospheres. At 150 atmospheres and 500 degrees the yield approaches 15 percent. As we've seen the conversion of nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia can be expressed by a simple chemical equation. But in practice, there are many problems which chemists and engineers have to overcome. The heart of the process is the ammonia converter. This is a vessel 80 feet high made of thick steel to withstand the high pressure that has to be used. This converter will take 180 tons of catalyst at a time. The catalyst is hoisted to the top in two-ton bags, a sight not often seen as the catalyst is only renewed once in every four or five years. The catalyst for the production of ammonia is iron, broken up into small lumps to give it a large surface area. The hydrogen and nitrogen are cooled and compressed. They pass into the converter and are heated and pass down through the catalyst. Some ammonia is produced. 
As the hot gases leave the converter, they are cooled. The ammonia is condensed and separated from the unconverted nitrogen and hydrogen, which are not wasted but recirculated, joining the incoming nitrogen and hydrogen in the compressor. The liquid ammonia flows into a letdown vessel which operates at a lower pressure. It passes through to the storage tanks and distribution system. Ammonia can be used directly as a fertilizer. Solutions are injected into the soil when the seed is drilled or they can be sprayed onto fields. But more often it is converted into other forms which means further processing. Much of it is converted to nitric acid and then to ammonium nitrate. To supply the fertilizer to farmers in a convenient form, concentrated ammonium nitrate solution is sprayed from the top of a high tower. The droplets of hot solution crystallize into hard spherical granules of uniform size on the way down. These are easy for the farmer to spread on his fields. Depending on the crop and the type of soil, fertilizer requirements will vary from field to field and country to country. Another form of nitrogenous fertilizer is urea. It is highly concentrated and much used in tropical climates. Carbon dioxide produced during the manufacture of ammonia is heated with ammonia under pressure. So far we've seen how ammonia is made from nitrogen and hydrogen and how it is used to make fertilizers. Ammonia and the nitric acid made from it have other important uses. For instance, in the manufacture of dye stuffs, of man-made fibers for clothes, and carpets. Ammonia is used to make perspex, from which many advertising signs are made. Nitric acid is used to make nylon, These men mining iron ore in Western Australia are using explosives made from nitric acid. But important as explosives, dyes, plastics and fibres are to us, it is the use of ammonia in fertilizers that is the most important of all. Fertilizers help to feed millions of people who would otherwise starve. Some countries are growing more legume crops, like soya beans and field beans, which can fix their own nitrogen from the air. These need no nitrogen added in the form of fertilizer, and when the residue is ploughed back after harvest, later crops will benefit from the fixed nitrogen in the roots. Soil microbiologists have always been intensely interested in the mechanism of nitrogen fixation in legume crops. They want to find out if nitrogen fixation can be made to work more effectively. For instance, at Rothamsted, they have collected different types of nodule bacteria from many different parts of the world. Here, they are inoculating bean plant seeds with the bacteria rhizobia, as they're called and will test the effectiveness of each type for fixing nitrogen. Microbiologists are also investigating other plants, such as types of tropical grasses which have no nodules but can fix their own nitrogen by association with soil bacteria.
Techniques of crossbreeding will be used to produce strains of plants better able to fix their own nitrogen and so producing more food for humans and animals. It is a field of research fascinating in its implications for man's future existence. But for many years yet, as populations grow and people live longer, we shall have to rely on fertilizers to supply the extra food that plants need to keep millions of us from starvation. This is why ammonia is such a very important chemical.